Hello, welcome everybody and thank you for joining us at this CPDP panel on social media monitoring, movement tracking and other digital threats against immigrants and exile <coughs> dissidents. My name is uh, Markus Michaelsen. I'm a researcher at the LSTS research group at the Freie Universität in Brussels and I will be the moderator on this panel. I will first give you a short introduction on the topic and the different questions we would like to uh, discuss during the session. Then I'll present you my co-panelists who will then each give a short input of about three to five minutes, followed by some question and discussion among us and then with you in the audience. So I hope you have your afternoon tea ready and will enjoy this session. Um, this panel is organized by the project DG Act that I'm currently working on in the LSTS research group, uh, which is financed by a Marie Curie Fellowship of the European Union. The project investigates digital threats and surveillance targeting exiled human rights defenders and journalists who reside in the European Union. It deals with what we call transnational repression, so authoritarian regimes repressive regimes trying to control and silence dissidents outside their borders. These regimes use assassinations, extradition requests, digital, at digital attacks, and other forms of harassment to threaten critics and opponents who no longer live on their territory. So they expand their power and treat the targeted persons as if they were still on their territory within their jurisdiction. And these practices obviously interfere with the human rights of the targeted persons and they have political and legal implications for the societies hosting the targeted immigrants. So how to protect people who have sought political asylum but are targeted by another state for their political views and activity. But also how to deal with requests for cooperation from countries persecuting these dissenters how to deal with requests for extradition or information sharing. Uh, we will discuss these issues during the first half of our panel. Then we will turn to how the EU itself exercises extraterritorial power. So we will be looking at the EU regime of border and migration control. We will discuss what has been called the shifting border. So the use of legal and technical tools to detach the border from the territory and to move it outwards. Our panelists will explain how digital technologies are used to monitor migrants and regulate their access to the European territory. In both cases, transnational repression and the shifting border, the long arm of the state stretches beyond borders to control people, restricting their mobility, interfering with their privacy and, at least in the case of the exiled dissidents, curtailing also their freedom of expression. And then in our final contribution, we will shift to questions of dissent and exile within the European Union. So we will discuss uh, the decision to abolish political asylum within the EU for people uh, who move from one country to another within the EU. Uh, by focusing on the case of the Catalan separatists. So I think this is an interesting and full program and I'm happy to discuss these questions with my uh, co-panelists, which I will present now uh, in their order of appearance. So we will ha first have Bota Jadamali, who is a Kazakh human rights defender and a licensed attorney in the state of New York and an outspoken critic of the Kazakh regime. She was granted political asylum in Belgium in 2013. And as a lawyer, she defends dissidents and opponents to the Kazakh re regime. Next, we will have uh, Christophe Marchand, who is a qualified attorney uh, with the law firm Juskogens in Brussels. He is also teaching public international law at Brussels University and has extensive experience in 
litigating international extradition cases, including at Interpol. And he is currently representing, among others, Julian Assange and the Catalan government in exile. Next, we will have uh, Petra Molnar from York University in Toronto, who is a lawyer and researcher at the Migration and Technology Monitor and the Refugee Law Lab and investigating human, the human rights impacts of migration management technologies. And she has been until just recently a Mozilla Fellow with EDRI, the European Digital Rights Network. And last, but certainly not least, we will have Sybil Top, who is a PhD student at the Fundamental Rights Center at the Law Faculty at the University of Brussels and the Institute of European Studies. And her research focuses on the relevance and application of the political offense exemption in European extradition law. So uh, I would like to start with Bota, uh, <coughs> and, uh, the, our topic of transnational uh, repression. So Bota, for years, you have been facing continuous harassment by uh, Kazakh authorities in an attempt to yeah, intimidate or silence you for your work as a lawyer and human rights defenders. Can you explain, uh, share with us the different methods with which uh, you have been uh, targeted after leaving your home country? Okay, thank you very much, Marcus. And uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm very happy that you join us uh, today. So, uh, yes, my case is a good illustration of harassment and persecution against refugees like me, asylum seekers, and political dissidents that had to leave their countries. And um, I'm wearing a refugee uh, hat today, so I'll give just uh, my examples, and my colleague Christophe Marchand will provide legal analysis of my case. Uh, so, what did the, uh, the regime in Kazakhstan do to stop me from doing my work? my job after I received political asylum. Kazakhstan, like many other non-democratic states, abuses mechanism of international cooperation and undermines the trust in the system. Uh, first of all, Kazakhstan put me on the Interpol wanted list. When the Interpol recognized Kazakhstan's criminal persecution against me to be politically motivated and uh, the red notice against me was canceled. Then Kazakhstan tried to extradite me twice, and it didn't work out. Belgium refused the extradition request. Then uh, Kazakhstan started acting illegally on the territory of, agent, uh, of Belgium uh, through its agents. In 2014, I received a credible threat that Kazakhstan hired uh, someone, and I quote, uh, to kidnap you or turn you into a vegetable. So I made a complaint to the authorities and police unfoiled a plot against me. And as a result, three people were sentenced by Brussels Criminal Court. It happened a little bit over a year ago. I was also recognized as a victim in another espionage case. In that case, uh, Kazakh agents physically followed me, my family members, rented an apartment across uh, the street from my house to spy on me, on my family. They put even a tracking device under my car, tried to hack me, etc., etc. So the case is still ongoing. And I've been, uh, like many, many uh, political dissidents, I've been a target of a very aggressive smear campaign online. Uh, for example, for the last two years, there have been over 150 publications in five different languages aimed to destroy my reputation. So this is a real campaign uh, for character assassination and, and you know how it works. Usually articles are posted on unknown websites that look like news websites and slowly false information makes its way uh, into the main media stream. And uh, the problem is that I cannot sue the state that sponsors this campaign for defamation. I have no jurisdiction to go after uh, anyone in this situation. A uh, few years ago, I was working on a very important extradition case in France, uh, defending the leader of our opposition. And Kazakhstan, through its agent, made a criminal complaint against me in Belgium. And the purpose of that case was to stop me from working and seize my work files. So a criminal case was opened on the basis of a complaint 
police came to my house one day at 5 a.m., arrested me and took all my documents, all my phones and all my devices. Uh, luckily, a few hours late, an instruction judge reconsidered my case. I was released. Everything was returned to me. So this way of harassing me didn't work. But a year later, already in 2017, uh, my brother who lived in Kazakhstan was arrested there. Or uh, just to be precise, he was taken hostage. When arrested, he was told, uh, make your sister come back to Kazakhstan and we will release you. So, of course, my brother refused to cooperate and he was severely tortured in detention and then sentenced to for seven years imprisonment. And uh, it took a lot of international pressure and after a two-year-long ordeal, uh, he was released on medical grounds. Um, so Kazakhstan did not recognize him as a political prisoner, they just made an excuse and released on medical grounds. He received the Swiss humanitarian visa and left the country. And I'm very happy to say that uh, a week ago, Switzerland granted him and his family political asylum. So, and uh, one of important aspects of my case is that we see serious abuse of mutual legal assistance requests. And uh, in October 2019, uh, when my brother was still in prison, when, like, when uh, he was tortured and it was well documented, he was already recognized as a political prisoner. Belgian police came to my apartment once again, but this time they came together with two officers from Kazakhstan and searched my place. And it was done pursuant to an MLA request made by Kazakh authorities. And it was accepted by the Belgian Minister of Justice. So Kazakhstan's authorities specifically asked for my documents and my electronic devices to be seized and transferred to Kazakhstan. And uh, now we are fighting to cancel that uh, MOA decision and have uh, all my documents returned to me. And um, I think these are good examples to demonstrate mm -hmm. how non-democratic regimes can harass people like me. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much for sharing these insights. Mm -hmm. Can you say a little bit more about uh, the effects that these uh, tactics have on your life in, in Belgium, in, in the host society? Mm -hmm. uh, no, uh, obviously, that uh, this type of harassment has a serious negative effect on my life and my, uh, life of my family. And it's not easy to fight back. It, it's a lot of resources. So instead of working on other cases, I have to defend myself and my family. So it affects my professional life. It affects my social life. You know, I'll give you an example. When Belgian policemen uh, showed me uh, pictures that Kazakh agent took, it was very unpleasant. For example, they showed me pictures where I was on a date or pictures that showed inside of my apartment and I live on the seventh floor. And, uh, you know, after, after seeing that, you go in kind of a voluntary lockdown yourself. And uh, obviously you become less social and become concerned about safety. And uh, this harassment affected very badly my reputation. For example, because of uh, this PR, that black PR, I had my bank accounts closed several times without any explanation. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I consider a right to have a bank account nowadays should be a basic human right. Because if you lose a bank account, you basically, you are not a functioning member of the society anymore. So, yes, it's negatively affected my life, mm -hmm. but, you know, I'm a professional and I'm going to keep fighting. Okay, uh, thank you so much for, for sharing the, uh, these experiences with us. I will now turn to, to Christoph, uh, who is uh, representing Bota as a lawyer here in, in, in Brussels. Uh, so, can you briefly explain the legal implications of uh, these threats which Bota and, and maybe also other exiled dissidents like her have exp are experiencing. Ah, we cannot hear you. Yes, sorry, I, 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 was, I was muted. Sorry. Okay. The unusual for a lawyer because we love to talk, but I mute myself just not to disturb the other ones. <laughs> So what I, I wanted to say, thank you first for inviting me for this panel. It's, um, I'm very happy because uh, I, I love CPDP, I know for so many years, 
and it's always an honor to uh, to participate to this very uh, important uh, event. So now about the situation, um, I think the the, um, the first thing I want to say is that uh, when we speak about harassment of political dissidents, it means that it's harassment, which means that the person has to defend herself and. It means that in, in our law firm, uh, there is uh, at least one or two lawyers working full time on her case every day because there's so many things to do just to resist the attacks from uh, the Kazakh state. Uh, Bota mentioned the uh, extradition cases, um, the, uh, the cases of harassment that she had to suffer from agents um, tracking her, um, filming her, um, just one aspect of the thing, but then the, the heart is really what do what does this authoritarian regime want? They want to silence the dissident. They want to um, have all the information they can have, they can hope to have for other dissidents in the other country, in the country here in Kazakhstan. So that's why they are harassing Bota. That's why they are trying to sneak into her devices to get the information to be able for more um, repression, torture, because that's what we are talking about, torture and silencing dissidents in uh, Kazakhstan. And so, of course, we have a means to fight against this, but it is getting so sophisticated that we have to really um, invent and that our legal system today in 21st century is not ready for that. We still have a, a system, I would say, um, that's focusing on the refugee uh, convention of 51. You know, uh, we want to protect people that are um, uh, dissidents and then the protection is okay when the person is in another territory. This is not the case anymore because there are so many means, I um, mean, digital means to get access to information that our legal tools today are not um, are not really effective. For example, uh, Bota told about this um, multilateral cooperation between Belgium and Kazakhstan. So it means that Kazakhstan send demands to Belgium to have information about her, to have information about her bank accounts, to have information about her movements, to have uh, information about her phone, to have all the data. I would say concerning uh, Bota. And this happened in the dark. I mean, there was no, and not any, not any contradiction. We were not informed, which is something quite normal in judicial cooperation. You don't inform the person. But here, from the moment that it concerns a refugee, there should be more protection. And this protection does not exist. So now we are um, in a heavy litigation, I would say, uh, because um, then we realized at one moment after there was the searches and when the police came into her, her apartment with the Kazakh police, you imagine that, you know, she was there with her family uh, being victim of torture. And then one day at five in the morning, you realize that police, Kazakh police is in your bedroom, is there and just talking to you. It was just like very surprising and, and something that we would not think could happen. It happened. But then the information was seized. Bota is a lawyer. Bota is an attorney in New York. Bota defends a lot of uh, Kazakh dissidents. She has a lot of information in her devices, in her documents. Everything was seized by the police. So the, th the thing is, and the legal question, which is new now, is how can we stop this cooperation? And it's something I was telling you that it's not, um, it's new. This sophistication of this authoritarian regime is new. So there are no, um, I would say, legal remedy that are in the law. For example, here, when someone is subjected of uh, multilateral cooperation, of a search and seizure, there is in Belgium, no, there is no uh, legal tool to stop the transmission to the other country or to have access to this case of the accusation. Why is this MLA uh, has been done? And there is also no possible remedy to, to disease to ask the Belgian authorities that seized the documents, that seized all this confidential information, very sensitive information about dissidents, to give this information back. So we, we of course, we are 
in Belgium, and I think it's the same in every country in the EU, uh, is the rule of law. So if there is no legal remedy, you have to invent it. And that's also in that line that the European Court of Justice is going. If there is a violation of a fundamental right in the frame of the application of EU law, there must be a remedy. That is the EU. That's EU law. There is no other way. There must be a remedy. So we seized a court that was supposed to be the court that is um, competent if there is a seizing in internal law. And this court said, well, you are inventing a procedure. And we said, yes, we are inventing it on basis of EU law. And then the court said, okay, I'm going to send your case to the constitutional court because I have like a constitutional door to do that. And our idea is just to try to get this to the European Court of Justice because we think it's an EU problem where there is this problem where there is no legal remedy. And we want the court in Luxembourg, something she loves to do, just to fill gaps if the fundamental rights are infringed. And that's what the court, I hope, if the constitutional court sends the case to Luxembourg, will do. So, in sum, and to finish, I think the, the, um, the situation of, of Bota is really emblematic to what a lot of refugees are suffering uh, in Belgium, but not only in Belgium, because this happens in all uh, other EU countries. You know, in this Kazakh situation, there are cases in Italy, there are cases in, um, in France, there are cases outside the EU, which is Switzerland, which is very, very close to, to the EU, in other European uh, countries. So there is really, when we say, is this the end of the protection of refugees in Europe? Not especially because of the refugee law, but something that goes around in the sophistication, probably due to this new way we are living with. I mean, about the data, the data is everywhere. The data is in your phone, the data is in your computer, and you can get access to that data. That's what the authoritarian regime wants, with not, without respecting the fundamental rights of the, of the refugees. Mm -hmm. Was that not too long? Is it okay? No, no, thank you. Very interesting. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, and, and what do you think, what are the uh, legal obligations of host governments uh, that should be yeah, renewed or, or activated? Well, we say that uh, there, there must be an assessment of how the cooperation works with uh, third countries to the EU. How do you do this multilateral cooperation? Um, it's quite interesting, but for example, when there, is multilateral, or when there is cooperation within the EU, if you are subject to this kind of cooperation, there is EU law protecting you. If goods are seized in Belgium because Germany wants it, you can go to a court to say the Germans are wrong. But if it's the same situation from Kazakhstan, you don't have any legal remedy. So that's something that should be organized at the European level, this cooperation with third state to the EU. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, any other uh, critical issues when we um, deal with these uh, threats of transnational re repression? So you mentioned yeah, the data transfer uh, or, or the yeah. seizing of critical information. But we have also yeah, agents really coming into uh, the territory of, of European countries and, and harassing and, and, and spying. Yeah, I think that's, that's something new that I also I've seen in other cases with uh, espionage cases, for example, from yeah. we had a, a Colombian case, for example, from espionage from the DAS, you know, this really this despised when, the, when Colombia was a very authoritative, authoritative country. Um, and then we, I realize, in fact, that we have more tools to, to, um, to fight against spionage because now, and that is due, I think, to EU law, but that has to be in, uh, implemented. I mean, as Bota said, only um, trying to access, um, trying to access um, um, a computer is already a crime, uh, according to EU law. And so trying to access a phone, um, violations of uh, privacy, all these are criminal offenses now. Mm -hmm. And this should be implemented, but of course it's quite new, um, and it's from. I mean, it's you know. I think the Commission should check whether uh, the protection that is that that came through uh, criminal EU law um, is really implemented, especially uh, for persons that are uh, uh, protected or need to be protected. Bota is is a recognized lawyer in danger by all the international uh, organizations of lawyers, recognized refugee. But she didn't have any protection uh, against all these attacks, like six, seven types of different attacks from uh, the Kazakh state. So this 
situation of dissidents, protected dissidents, should be taken into account in the framing of those, uh, those, those, those laws, in the framing of the protection and the framing of the remedies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Yeah, these are really uh, interesting points and I hope we will uh, come back to that uh, during the discussion for the okay, sake of our procedure, of our time. I will move forward now to our next uh, subtopic, if we want. So we have heard now how liberal regimes are trying to extend their control beyond borders into uh, yeah, established Western uh, democracies and what the implication of these practices are for uh, the targeted uh, communities or dissidents. And now we will turn to the EU as a political actor exercising its power outside its territorial border for our example here is uh, purposes of migration control. So uh, Petra, you have done extensive field research among others in, in Greece with migrants and on migration control. Uh, you have also just published an extensive report on the use of technology in migration management. Uh, can you share with us some of your key insights uh, from this research? How is the EU exercising power beyond its borders and what role also does technology play in this? Thank you so much, Marcus, for, for having me. And thank you also to Bota in particular for sharing your story. I think it's so important to ground the discussion that we're having in real people's experiences, because oftentimes when we talk about privacy, technology and surveillance, it can seem uh, a little bit divorced from the daily reality of people. Um, so thank you for the opportunity to, to discuss a little bit about my work. Um, I'd like to zoom out a little and, and, and look at it from a more systemic or an ecosystem perspective to try and unpack some of the reasons why, particularly um, at the European Union level, we are seeing this kind of increased experimentation on marginalized communities um, before at the border and even beyond the border. And, you know, I think it's important to, again, look at it uh, from the particular point in time in which we find ourselves. We are seeing an increased kind of conflation of criminalization of migration, rising xenophobia, and a lot of kind of risk-based taxonomies to try and understand why people are moving, flag certain cases, and make really, really problematic assumptions about people's experiences. In my work, we're trying to highlight how this class of so-called migration management technologies oftentimes is used as an excuse to infringe on people's rights and also to securitize Fortress Europe even more. And like Marcus, like you said, what we're also trying to understand is how the border as a space has been moving beyond the kind of geographic demarcation of a physical space, but also has been pushed farther afield, further away from the actual edges of Europe. And unfortunately, technologies, surveillance and, and automation, that could mean you know, um, artificial intelligence, decision making, drones, different types of technologies are increasingly able to push the European border space further and further afield. Now, the issue with this is that because we're seeing this proliferation of um, technology uh, at essentially every single point of a person's migration journey, the problem with this is that currently the legal regime that regulates and governs the development and deployment of technology in these high-risk settings is woefully inadequate. Really, when we're trying to figure out, you know, what are some of the human rights implications, having a holistic assessment of this is really key because we're not only really just talking about privacy and data rights, we're also talking about discrimination and systemic and historical discrimination. Because again, what we are concerned about is the fact that this type of technological experimentation and surveillance happens particularly against communities that are on the margins, that are somehow able to be tested upon, experimented upon without um, sufficient human rights um, considerations and safeguards. And one of the reasons why this is allowed to happen is particularly because, again, the context in which we're, that we're talking about here is key. We're talking about immigration decision-making, border decision-making, and this particular space of decision-making is already very opaque. Even when you have human decision makers, officers, judges making all sorts of determinations, the ways that um, different decisions are able to, to be rendered 
even by humans, is difficult to sometimes understand. And now what happens when you start importing a lot of technology, whether you're talking about surveillance or automation into the mix? It, it's really troubling because, again, when you're trying to understand it from an administrative law perspective or a human rights law perspective, um, the parameters in which these decisions get made is, is really, really opaque, discretionary, and difficult to understand. Not to mention, too, of course, that we are seeing a rise of transnational surveillance, um, like my previous panelists um, were talking about, and data sharing across the world, not even just within the European Union space. Um, but again, this goes to show that there is this kind of decentralization of, of the border and, and technologies of migration management are um, really kind of at the center of this. And uh, I know perhaps maybe we'll get into this a little bit later, but, you know, having a, a systemic understanding of why this is a, allowed to occur is, is really important because there's a lot of different actors um, that are implicated in this, the state, but also the private sector. And it's perhaps about broader questions too, about whose priorities matter and who gets to set the agenda of what we innovate and why. This is really what we're trying to, to do with our work, to show that certain communities are kind of the guinea pigs or the testing grounds, and certain powerful actors like states and the private sector are the ones that get to set the stage for, for what is considered uh, innovative in this space. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Um, very interesting points. So I know that you have also uh, interviewed uh, migrants or people who have moved already into the EU or, or out, are still on the border. Uh, um, what can you say? Because we have heard also these more personal insights uh, from Bota. What can you say about the effects on, on them as, as individuals uh, of these yeah, tracking uh, mechanisms or, or, or these yeah, technological means to, to control their, their movements? Can you give us some, some anecdotes or material? Yeah. Sure, sure, I'd be happy to. Um, and I mean, I think it's important to bring uh, these types of experiences to the conversation at the outset when, when we are designing projects or trying to understand the ramifications of tech, because oftentimes what I've found in the digital rights space is the engagement with affected communities comes mm -hmm. as an afterthought, kind of as a band-aid to solution to maybe a project that should have been engaging with um, communities right at the outset. What we're trying to do at the Migration Technology Monitor is really to think through how participatory action research can occur from day one and uh, who gets to, again, set the priorities of, of what matters. And so in the conversations that I was able to have, and I should also say, you know, COVID definitely impacted the scope of our project. We really wanted to do a transnational comparator study, look at, you know, all sorts of places and unfortunately doing um, on the ground research and interviews with people during the pandemic is difficult and, and can be, of course, unsafe if you're, you know, a researcher coming into a vulnerable community already. We were able to um, do some conversations actually in Belgium and then also in Greece, just through a variety of um, community connections that we already had, um, which was uh, really, really illuminating. Um, and but what's quite interesting for me, I should perhaps also say, you know, I'm a relative newcomer to the digital rights space. Um, I'm a refugee and immigration lawyer by training myself as well. And I sometimes, I think, still fall under that kind of category of, well, you know, if people are dealing with things like deportation, um, you know, not seeing your spouse for 10 years, do they really care about AI? Do they care about surveillance? Do they care about drones? And I think it's really important to engage again with communities um, who have lived experience of migration at the outset because it's quite fascinating to see how people are conceptualizing these threats um, that are already facing them as they're moving across uh, the world. And a lot of the, the, the kind of tropes that came out in the conversations that I was able to have, mostly with young East African men, for example, was the concern around systemic racism and the exacerbation of the issues of inequality that they already face when dealing with human decision makers at and around the border. And the concern that, of course, as we know, you know, algorithmic decision making, for example, isn't neutral. People were concerned that, you know, the races that they face on the daily uh, in the violent kind of uh, manifestations of the immigration and migration management regime are going to just be replicated um, through the tools um, that you know governments and states and, and private actors at and around the border are able to use. 
people talked about, for example, feeling also dehumanized or, or reduced to a data point or a fingerprint or or just an iris scan and, and that kind of lack of contextual specificity and, and humanity and, and perhaps dignity um, is really something that came out of a lot of conversations as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Um, and, and do you think um, there's enough public information or, or, or transparency on these forms of, of border control? Is there, is the debate, uh, yeah, lively enough or do we have enough debate at all? I think the debate is yeah. growing, definitely, but that this is a huge piece of the puzzle. Um, the lack of accountability and transparency and, yeah. and just public yeah. knowledge. Um, public broadly construed, but also against specific communities that are at the sharp edges of this harmful technological development. There really isn't as much engagement on these issues as there needs to be. And perhaps, you know, in, in my work, I, I argue that this is deliberate. This lack of transparency and lack of governance is in fact a deliberate exercise by powerful actors to be able to experiment with technology in a setting where you know a lot of people don't know that it's happening to them a lot of people don't have mechanisms of redress a lot of people feel coerced for example you know you, ha you have to either get your iris scanned in a refugee camp or you don't eat that week you know like if there there are these issues around um, you know meaningfully being able to opt out even from data collection that just play out very differently when you are in a in a space where there is an inherent power differential between the data subject and the entity that is kind of wielding the technological power. So I think, again, we need to engage uh, people who are kind of at the, the edges of this experimentation, but then also the broader public. And I think venues like CPDP are great for that because we are able to have conversations across different disciplines, different lived experience, um, and just different framings uh, on these issues. But we definitely need to have more of this, particularly also at the policy level. Because again, there is this lack of specificity in terms of how these technologies play out on, on different communities and people's lives. Okay. I still see Petra talking, but no noise. Okay, it was a bit delayed. <laughs> Thank you so much, Petra, for, for uh, this. These are really interesting points. Uh, and I hope we can get back uh, to it uh, in the discussion again. Um, finally, we will come now to our uh, last but not least speaker. Uh, we will come to um, the EU's internal immigrants. So people who move from for political reasons from one European country uh, to another to seek uh, protection. Uh, uh, and these cases are, of course, as everything else, regulated within the EU, but these regulations are of, not without their politics and, and interests uh, involved. So Sybil uh, is working uh, on these uh, cases. So can you share uh, some insights uh, with us on the politics of uh, political asylum within the EU and, and uh, the politics of yeah, political extradition requests? Yeah, thank you, Marcus. So indeed, as you said, transnational repression does not only happen in illiberal and authoritarian regimes, it also very much happens in well-established democracies like uh, the Spanish one, for example. I will take that example to illustrate my, my point today. So as you may know, Spain was the target for many years, decades even, of uh, domestic terrorism with the Basque ETA movement, which is a national liberation movement in, um, in the Basque, for the Basque country. Uh, it has a political wing and a paramilitary wing, and the paramilitary wing is on the EU list of terrorist uh, organizations, but not the political one, despite uh, Spanish efforts in that direction. And um, so back then, when uh, several, when two, when a couple of Basque uh, militants fled to Belgium, uh, Spain naturally uh, requested their extradition to prosecute them. But uh, Spain, uh, sorry, Belgium uh, refused. And uh, this really shocked Spain. The, the argument of uh, Belgium, Belgium, sorry, was that 
Um, there were countless reports of uh, tor torture allegations in Spain against uh, Basque dissidents, but also unfair trials and, you know, uh, mistreatment by the Guardia Civil, the national police as well. And so based on these uh, reports uh, of uh, international organizations, they, they decided to refuse the extradition. But apparently, local level, there was actually very little doubt about the fact that these people were indeed guilty of the uh, charges pressed against them by the Spanish state, but the human rights concerns uh, prevailed in that sense. And uh, this uh, Belgian refusal to extradite the couple literally infuriated uh, Spanish authorities, who then started a very heavy and fierce campaign to abolish the right to asylum for EU citizens in the EU and the political offense exception clause to extradition, which is a clause that precludes extradition from taking place if the, the crime for which it is requested is uh, a political one. Uh, the idea behind that clause is that if a person commits a crime against the state and that the state wants to prosecute that person, it would be both judge and jury and therefore unable to adjudicate impartially on these issues. And there's also, you know, a whole ideological uh, uh, element to it that, you know, it comes from the French Revolution, the idea that if people fight against you know, tyranny, despotism to uphold, you know, uh, democratic and uh, liberal values, then these people should be protected and not be sent back. So these two mechanisms, asylum and, uh, and the political offense exception clause to extradition uh, are, are two humanitarian clauses in nature, and they have been abolished in the EU for the purpose of combating terrorism. So for me, that would be your first red flag right there, but apparently it was not for uh, EU member states. And um, Spain at the time was just very, very successful in uploading its counter uh, terrorism agenda that it had at the domestic level and to upload it at the, at the EU level. And it became even more uh, powerful in that sense after, I mean, uh, successful in that sense after the 9-11 attacks, of course. The, the, the case that I'm talking about, I forgot to mention that maybe I should have, was in the started in the early 90s and ended uh, in, in the, around the mid 90s. And so, what I'm saying here is that uh, it's normal that Spain, you know, should try to get these people if they consider them as terrorists, but now it is faced with yet another separatist challenge and these tools that were adopted back then to combat terrorism are now used to get back uh, Catalan leaders who, unlike Basque separatists, were peaceful in their, um, in their uh, in behavior. And so, Again, I'm not saying that if Spain wants to, if a country uh, um, wants to prosecute people because these people broke the, broke the law, sorry, it should not be, it should not uh, not make use of the tools that it has at its disposal. We agree on that. I mean, if there's a European arrest warrant system, which is the latest EU extradition system, then Spain indeed should make use of it. But what shocked many was the severity of the repression and the abusive use uh, by the Spanish authorities of the European arrest warrant system. And uh, I, I circle back to what I said at the, in the first presentation, uh, Spain has been accused of uh, abusing the system and weakening the trust uh, on which it is based uh, by uh, sending repeated uh, European arrest warrant requests to, uh, to get Catalan leaders back. And so I guess uh, this is my point. I don't know if it counts as repression, but it certainly do as intimidation. And this happens in the EU uh, today. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Sidel. Um, I know that uh, in the case of the Catalan politicians, um, digital surveillance also uh, played a role. Maybe you can give us some more details about that. Yes, so uh, last year we had reports uh, unveiled by uh, The Guardian and El País of um, spyware being used against uh, Catalan uh, activists. 
And so it's a bit contentious because um, the, the spyware in question is called Be Pegasus and uh, it enabled it it used for two weeks, apparently a two week slot. Uh, it, it exploited the weaknesses of the WhatsApp messaging system. So apparently it was possible to access to emails, messages, uh, pictures, but also um, the, uh, but also it was also able, sorry, to take over the camera and um, and uh, speak, uh, microphone of the phone and turn it into a listening device. And so when asked if uh, they were involved in this, uh, the Spanish government said uh, didn't re said didn't really say no, but uh, didn't really uh, deny it, uh, deny nor confirm anything. And what is in, what is very compelling in this case is that the group producing this software, the NSO group, says that they only sell to governments. So I would be quite interested in knowing what other governments would be interested in spying on Catalan leaders. And what's very, very worrying in here is that it was used, if it's true, it was, it was then used against democratically elected uh, representatives. One is a former MP in exile now in, Swiss, in Switzerland and uh, one of the people they targeted. And because there are many, but another one of these people is the current president of the Catalan uh, parliament. So if this is indeed true, then these softwares are, are used in the EU to spy against uh, democratically elected political opponents. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, and then uh, one more question to you, but maybe also uh, to Christoph, uh, who's also um, involved in, in these cases. So what do you think uh, is at stake for the EU in, in, in these cases? Because we will have maybe in the future uh, more differences between EU countries in the application of, of the rule of law and then maybe more uh, cases of uh, people uh, moving uh, from one European country to another to, to escape what, what they think is unjust uh, uh, treatment of, of their case or restrictions of, of their, their rights. Uh, I'm thinking maybe of Poland or, or Hungary. Maybe Christophe, you go first. Yeah, I have, I have one, uh, one um, well, thank you very much for, for this, um, uh, it was, it was um, I think the, the, the key issue that I see also when I, when I try to make some links with what Bota said yeah. and also with what Petra said, um, is that um, I think we are facing new uh, threats um, on our privacy. Uh, for example, when um, when Sibel talks about Pegasus, uh, when Bota talks about um, uh, hacks on, on, in her computers, um, and when um, uh, Petra uh, talks about uh, coercing uh, um, iris, coercing uh, fingerprints, um, it means that but this is these are all actions um, that are really um, protected by EU law, that are really um, uh, regulated by EU law, um, and that are very strict regulated. Um, and but there is no there is no legal remedy. Again, that, that's what I'm saying. And there is no um, I would say control on the implementations of these techniques. When I talk, when I take the the case of. Uh, the tracking, for example, of a car of uh, cars with German in Belgium uh, by these, these Span Spanish uh, secret services, probably. Um, it's very hard to, to um, and there is also little will to, um, to, to lead an investigation that would lead to accountability. When we speak about Pegasus, it's the same. And it really makes me think, to my, try to make a broader conversation, Marcus, if I dare. It really makes me think about what happened, for example, with the Snowden revelation. You know, Snowden, when Snowden said that, the, the, uh, that, we, that they, they want to collect it all, that they want to collect all the data, when he referred to uh, hacking on, for example, Belgacom, on the, the tubes, you know, that they were like, I don't know, syringes just taking all the information. This is all crime, but there is no investigation. There is no accountability for that. And I think, uh, really, uh, if you want to keep our protection of uh, refugee and of, our, of, of 
refugee in general, but also of the citizens, there must be accountability for uh, for violations of privacy like this. Should be at the border for migrants coming. Should be for uh, dissidents coming from Kazakhstan. Should be from for people coming uh, or traveling in the EU looking for protection. Should be tomorrow for uh, judges from Poland uh, going somewhere else because they fear uh, a repressive Polish system. That's a bit the reflection that it makes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, if I just may raise, ah, Sibyl, you also want to? Yeah, I mean, just briefly for me, what's at, st at stake here is that when we adopt this kind of, uh, you know, um, uh, cooperation tools, especially when they're this invasive, we need to think of you know future possible scenarios. Uh, I'm sure that when we abolish the asylum possibility, uh, the asylum possibilities in the EU for EU citizens, we would we didn't think at the time that uh, uh, Poland or Hungary would uh, have an Article Seven triggered against them. You know uh, because they they systematically violated the fundamental rules and you know uh, principles and values of the EU. And so it's just that. But yeah, we need to think of the, I would say, the worst scenario possible and ad ad adapt the tools to those situations. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. So one last question from me. I have already noted down some questions from the audience, um, uh, but one last question from my side. Um, in all these cases, uh, we've seen also a prominent role for the private sector in developing uh, technologies that are used to monitor, to survey uh, the, the populations in question or the individuals in question. So is there any way, uh, do you see any way, this is maybe a question primarily to the lawyers among, do you see any way to hold the, the private sector uh, in these cases to account or, or to, to yeah, regulate and interfere with their uh, practices? Anyone who would like to start? Petra, you, I, I, maybe, do you have any ideas? Yeah. Yeah, I can, I can jump in. Um, I apologize if my connection isn't the best. Um, but yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think the private sector is such an important actor in this conversation, particularly because, of course, as a sector, it has its own obligations and rules around the human rights impl implications of, of the technology that it develops and deploys. But it gets tricky, right? Because when you're talking about for example, administrative decision making in the immigration context and technology that's bought by the public sector. Um, there is this kind of responsibility laundering some people have called or passing the hot potato back and forth between a public entity and a private entity. And a public entity is able to say, well, you know, we're not really responsible because we didn't develop this in house. A private entity will then say, well, it's not really our responsibility either because we're protected by corporate shields, intellectual property, et cetera, et cetera. And then the affected person, um, you know, falls through the cracks uh, of this, this kind of accountability regime. But I think it's also broader questions. It's, it's about whose priorities matter in the conversations when it comes to innovation. For example, why are we creating AI lie detectors that are incredibly discriminatory to be rolled out at European borders. Why aren't we using AI to root out racist border guards, right? Like the, the priorities that get set out in these projects are largely because the private sector is able to determine what the bottom line is, whose priorities count, and what particular projects are funded and therefore pushed forward. So again, I think it's it, there needs to be a reckoning about the power of big tech and this kind of hubris also that big tech holds when it comes to thinking it has all these answers for really complex social problems. When you're looking at, for example, the rollout of humanitarian type technology or technologies used in refugee camps. I mean, again, it's this um, this idea that the private sector somehow holds all the answers in this in this sector when really mm -hmm. the, the truth could not be further from that. The others, Edith? Um, yeah, yeah. Let me, yeah, may, may add a little bit, and I just uh, would like to highlight the um, importance, of res importance of responsibility of private actors. And this is what we see um, the trend, and uh, like, like I see in the cases uh, that uh, mainly come from the former Soviet Union countries, when the, the regime, the countries, they actually hide behind private actors. We see when the uh, kind of uh, private companies or quasi comp uh, private companies, they become actually, uh, because they are fully controlled by the regimes, right? Uh, 
either it's like by you know controlled through the oligarchs or controlled from people that depend on the regimes in various shape or forms they uh, actually use as instruments to prosecute people abroad and very often um, it, this is new in judiciary uh, in the west it has to figure out that is actually not a genuine for example civil proceeding brought against the person but it's actually a part of uh, continuous uh, uh, political harassment and the government is hiding behind that private actor and in my case for example what I see very often and in the case in other cases where I work uh, government doesn't like when I say that they hired agents I I'm not saying that this is some kind of uh, people that in the Kazakh military that come on the territory in Belgium is it's more sophisticated than that usually they hire lawyers somewhere in England, for example. So they behind, hide uh, behind attorney-client privilege. We don't see what's happening and who actually hired those words. And then the lawyers hire private, what they call detective agencies. And those detection agencies come and illegally spy and use all those military techniques that they, they uh, learn to use. That in my case, I, I had a former Mossad agent. I had a former... Uh, UK military agents spying on me. The territory already as a uh, bona fide uh, detectives, but use those military techniques that l they learned in Iraq and Afghanistan and basically hunt us down like prey. And uh, if you take them, you, you basically hit that wall at some point. The police doesn't go any further because they are hired from in another jurisdiction and then there are lawyers hide, uh, that they can hide behind them, etc., etc. Mm -hmm. So it's a very, very hard to, cre uh, to see how governments hide behind private actors. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Christoph, uh, do you have any uh, thoughts? You moved now uh, with your, to, to Luxembourg, so this is one thing, but do you think proceeding against the, the private sector w would be another option? Well, I think, the, yeah, it's, it's quite uh, complex, but I think, for example, in some cases of uh, cooperation, between Belgium and other, other states when, for example, um, bank information is asked or when, for example, uh, information, data information is asked to uh, phone companies or to internet companies, uh, there should be um, a control because the person who is subjected to the uh, measure uh, is not informed of this, which is something I can understand with the precaution I said before for refugees, I think the state should be more cautious, but also in the way the private um, sector will give the information, there should be um, an assessment within the, the, uh, the, 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 uh, the group, within the private uh, company in question before sending the information. Why I, is this information <coughs> a demand coming from Kazakhstan you want me to give information to Kazakh state I think uh, every company should just say well just hold on I don't want to be uh, accomplice to any information that would be used afterwards to torture someone so there should be um, a hard uh, internal control before giving the information that's one thing but also uh, a judicial control I always fall down on it because otherwise you come to some privatization of justice which we can we can talk all, also about for hours but this uh, and judicial review is also necessary but I think it should be also a primary check from the company otherwise there would be somehow um, accomplices of information that's shared to uh, authoritarian regimes mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. okay thank you very much uh, so I have now one question from the audience uh, asking uh, social media could also help prove that you are an asylum seeker. So um, we know that on, on the refugees are sometimes obliged to to open their social media accounts or forced uh, to, or uh, it is uh, taken from from their devices, um, which is rather an intrusion. But um, do you think it could be also have a positive effect, helping them? Uh, to show that they are uh, persecuted and uh, so that people would be more willing to, to show their private information. Maybe Bota and, and, and Petra would like to 
uh, speak about uh, answer this question? I I just answer uh, like, like very very quickly. I don't believe that any information that you share on social media, even in your private chats, is private to begin with. And mm. this is every potential asylum seeker, any dissident, any person who involves in with opposition should understand uh, clearly uh, <laughs> and uh, should not have any illusions about that. So um, I think that, uh, of course, it can help, right? Uh, then, um, but in general, I, I, uh, I do the other way around. I recommend people be extremely careful what they put online, what they write in their private chats. Because, for example, I had when one of my accounts that I use called Facebook was hacked and I had a lot of emails. This is basically, you know, how all these notifications uh, uh, that, you know, my correspondence with uh, activists in Kazakhstan basically, um, you know, got into the hands of those who hacked, hacked my account. So I would just recommend be very careful with uh, general. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Petra, you have seen cases where people would be willing to show uh, their information? I think it's a it's a tricky question because, you know, I def definitely for myself, you know, when I represented people, there would be times where we would rely on certain evidence from social media um, to strengthen a person's case. But uh, like Bota said, I think it's, it's really critical to think about, you know, what type of, um, you know, information is already out there and rather also how that information can be twisted against a person's uh, asylum claim. So in Canada, there was a, a line of jurisprudence where, for example, when people were making PG claims on sexual orientation and gender-based identity grounds, um, sometimes the immigration officer would do their own research, which they were not really supposed to do, but of course we know that's nothing on social media, it's private. And then they would bring um, questions to the hearing, say, well, you know, you are claiming that you are um, persecuted because of your identity as a gay man, but here you are, there's pictures of you partying with women. Care to explain that? I mean, it's like really, really problematic assumptions that get made about people's behavior generally, but unfortunately, social media is a stamp through which judicial decision makers and immigration officers make even more problem assumptions about that. And I think it's, it's really incumbent upon anyone, like Bota said, who is going through the adjudication system or, or claiming um, refugee protection to realize that absolutely your, the entire evidentiary record has been expanded to include basically every single internet footprint um, or social media um, post that you might have uh, ever put on or, or interacted with. So it's, it's a difficult one. I, I think on some level, if done correctly, perhaps it can be a benefit, but I've unfortunately seen more uh, cases um, where it actually is a detriment more than anything. Okay, thank you very much. And then we have one uh, comment from Paul Dehert, which I will turn into a question, and it might be also our concluding question, uh, because we are running out of time. Yeah, he said uh, territory is losing its protective interface, another illusion lost. Um, so uh, what do you think? Uh, yeah, we have discussed these uh, practices. So is it, uh, as the title uh, of our panel said, is it yeah, the end of the political asylum in the EU? So the, the, we have people who cannot get on the territory because the border has moved uh, outside and people who are uh, on the territory are also um, uh, threatened and, and uh, harassed. So, um, what? How do these practices affect uh, the capacity to protect uh, and to seek uh, asylum? The, the ability of people to claim and enjoy uh, this right. So, maybe some sort of concluding uh, statements from all of you. Um, may may I say? Yeah. Uh, yes, sure. um, I ahead. think that uh, also it sounds like a territory is losing its meaning, but I think that we are just we are just facing new challenges with uh, you know extraterritorial actions due to new technology, new means of uh, ways of uh, how regimes can harass people uh, on territories of other states. But um, I uh, say just um, kind of through human experience, I would say that it, 
it still makes sense when you physically remove yourself from danger it still makes sense here i am i am safe i am in, in my house my brother is safe also he's very unhealthy right now but he's still in a safe place he can get access to the doctors with everything else we can fight we still have access to uh, uh judiciary we have to invent new tools my case is now in a uh, for example, in a, um, a constitutional court, but you know, my, my, my child getting education, uh, we are not written in prison, we are not tortured, we are alive. So this is the most important thing, and this is in the end of the day, like, you know, I always say, whatever is happening, like, like I can be very upset with the actions of the Belgian Ministry of Justice that is cooperating with the same time. I am super, super grateful, and I will be grateful forever to the Belgian authorities for granting me this political asylum and saving my life and saving my family. So mm -hmm. it still makes sense, and in the uh, end of the day, you know, we can deal with other challenges. That's why we are talking about it. But uh, sometimes physical escape from, uh, from danger is the most important thing. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, we are running off of, out of time, but maybe some short statements, concluding thoughts from any of you. Okay, everybody one minute. <laughs> but just to, to add up on what B Bota said, so it, I, I agree that physical extraction of, from a dangerous situation is essential. But then, as you can see with the case of Assange, who was physically safe, but so much targeted by the extraterritoriality of other states that in the end, uh, the UN rapporteur on torture and inhuman and degrading treat treatment said that he had been subject to torture. So I think in, indeed it can have a very tangible and real effects on people, even when physically, I mean, in your case, physically, even they came to your place in, in Belgium, but uh, okay, I will. <laughs> so, my point was done anyway. I was just no, continuing. No, yes. Okay. Thank you. Petra, you want to go? Or? Yeah, yeah, no. I agree. Okay. Christoph? Yeah, just a few words just to jump on this. We have, of course, a lot of challenges, and I'm sure Polder Hat still have a lot of illusions and also challenges that are. And this is also what CPDP is for. It's just to put the words on what's going on. We have new challenges. And we're going to fight with that within EU law. And I think EU law has a lot of tools to help us. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, uh, Peter, you were cut for a moment, but now any last words? <laughs> I suppose, you know, just the premise that territory is always a political exercise and the ability to have uh, access to territory is not experienced the same by everyone. It's, it's, I think, again, that contextual specificity in these conversations is key. Okay. So, yeah. I think, yeah, the connection was a bit bad. But with this, yeah, I would then uh, conclude. Thank you very much uh, to all of you. It was a very interesting conversation. And thank you also to the audience. Uh, I think uh, we are done and uh, uh, closing on time. Thank you so much for, for investing your time and energy to the session. <laughs> thank, you. thank you. Okay. Bye. Thank you so much. Okay. So technical. <laughs>